Hello again, everyone, and welcome back to the Ramsey Center's Distinguished Speaker Series for 2022. We are welcoming this time a very special guest. Why is that? Because you might say that today our speaker series comes into conversation with our undergraduate degree program. It would be hard to think of anyone whose vocation and life story could be more closely aligned with the center's own mission, core purposes, than today's guest. In fact, it might be fairer to say that it's we who are aligned with his. And this is Professor Roosevelt Montas, who currently lectures in American Studies and English at Columbia University in New York City, where he is also the director of the Freedom and Citizenship Program. But, and here's the thing, when we were setting up the Ramsey Center five years ago, Professor Montas was coming towards the end of an almost 10-year stint as director of the world-famous, long-established core curriculum at Columbia, that is the liberal arts program that is a required course for all undergraduate students at one of America's top universities. In fact, only this one has such a thing. And that core curriculum program, together with one other one, the equally famous great books degree at St. John's College in Annapolis and Santa Fe, where, by the way, and indulge me for a second, we do send Ramsey postgraduate scholars every year to take their masters in liberal arts. And we heard from the president of St. John's in our speakers program four years ago, but the Columbia program, which Professor Montas has run for so long, was our primary inspiration together with St. John's for the degree model that our center proposed to potential university partners in Australia as the kind of thing we would be keen to fund. And as you may know, three of those universities have now implemented their own versions of the model. So the Columbia core curriculum really matters to the Ramsey Center. In fact, it's really more or less foundational for the core part of our mission. And here to talk to us about that core curriculum, about liberal arts, and importantly about his own life, is one of its longest serving directors. So Roosevelt Montas was born in the Dominican Republic and emigrated with his family to New York at the age of 12. His is a truly inspiring story of significant disadvantage overcome as from this low-income migrant background, he was able to achieve entrance to Columbia and that famous degree himself, eventually going to the very top and running the whole show. And he tells this remarkable and very moving story in his recent book, which you can see just behind me there on, on, the, uh, on the pedestal. His recent book is called Rescuing Socrates, how the great books changed my life and why they matter for a new generation. It was published last year by Princeton University Press. And we're going to use this book as the center of our conversation today about the liberal arts, great books programs, and why they are so important. So our title for today is The Liberal Arts, Why They Matter More Than Ever. And a very warm welcome to you, Roosevelt Montas. Thank you, Simon. It's really a pleasure to be here to talk about something that we, we care about so deeply um, in common. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, look, I thought um, we might start with thinking a little bit about you and the life story that you, that you tell so wonderfully in this book. Uh, but just to set the scene, your book has three main strands, right? So one strand is that it contains introductions to four great thinkers who've been highly influential in your, in your life, uh, Augustine, Socrates, Freud, and Gandhi, and that those are in fact your chapter headings in the book. And then there's a story that's, that's kind of interwoven with this terrific story of your life, as I was saying, from a lonely 12-year-old non-English speaking immigrant to director of the famous Columbia Corps um, um, program curriculum. But then the other element in the book, which I hope we'll have time to, to, to think, to talk about a bit, a defense of the liberal arts approach a liberal arts curriculum and the associated kind of teaching which, which is needed for such a program in universities. So 
If we can start with the life story, tell us something, Roosevelt, about your journey from Cambita to Colombia, uh, and maybe particularly what you call, I think in your book, discontinuity in such a life, and how you've made continuity out of it, how you've made sense of that journey. Uh, yeah, thank you, Simon. Um, I started writing Rescuing Socrates at the very end of my tenure as director of the Center for the Core Curriculum here at Columbia. And throughout that tenure, I had made it a point, sort of a mission to be outward facing, to not only run the program, teach in the program, cultivate the scholars and the, the young scholars and recruit senior scholars, but also to export that model, to support initiatives and uh, projects that advanced this form of education to encourage um, such places and to use our, our, our visibility, our know-how to um, support this whole broad endeavor. And uh, I did that by going around the country internationally, speaking, holding seminars at Columbia, et cetera, publishing here and there. But as I began to wrap up my tenure and, and, and thought about writing a book that in some way captured this aspect of the work I had been doing, it became clear to me that I needed to talk about the way that this education had been important in my own life. A peculiarity about liberal education and a peculiarity about liberal education that's organized around the study of what we can call great books of foundational, transformative, important texts in, in, in our history and our background. A peculiarity of that form of education is that it is a personal journey. Its value comes from the ways in which it can transform and open up the world for a student. It's not a technical education. It's not a professional education. It is an education that is aimed at cultivating human beings. So it seemed to me that if I was going to make a full case for that type of education, I needed to reflect on the ways it had shaped me. And it so happened that the way in which, it, in which it had shaped me was so striking, was so uh, visible in the way that I lived my life, that it provided a, a, a very useful vehicle. I was born in the Dominican Republic, um, uh, a developing nation, as we call it. Some people call it third world country. Um, not only is it a developing or third world nation, I was born in a rural village um, up in the mountains in a, in a really, in a world that is pretty much unimaginable to almost anyone I describe it to. Uh, sometimes it's a sort of a way to frame the kind of life I live. I simply say, I didn't have a TV, I didn't have a telephone, I didn't have a refrigerator, didn't have a stove. Um, we lived in a very small agricultural society that felt more like what the 19th century pre-industrial world felt like. Um, then when I was nine years old, my mother left that small town to move to New York City. And the point of her departure to New York City was to open a way, create the possibility for my brother and I, I have an older brother who's five years older than I, to come to the United States, which she achieved in, in short order. So we came when I was about to turn 12 years old to unite with her. She at the time had a minimum wage job at a factory, uh, which she at a garment factory, which, which she lost. She obviously didn't speak English. She had not completed a high school degree. We didn't speak English. Um, and we came into a pretty hard scrabble uh, life in New York as poor, disoriented, disempowered, marginal uh, immigrants to New York City. I attended the local public school in my neighborhood in Queens, New York, um, into the seventh grade, the bilingual program, the, the, the New York City public school system, even though it's got much to be proud of, it, it, it has even more to be uh, worried, concerned, and alarmed by. Uh, so many of its schools are underachieving, overcrowded, under-resourced. 
um, and in fact, do not deliver a education worthy uh, that recognizes the dignity and the value that deserve what 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 a child deserves. Um, so it was, it was it was very hard. I then went to high school again, the local public high school. Um, the conditions in the local public high school were, in some sense, the 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 best example of the possibilities of a public school system like like New York's. It was a a high school that was had a high concentration of immigrants. It was at the time that I was there, the most diverse high school in New York City. And that meant, among other things, that there was a cohort of students there that I fell in with that were academically ambitious, ambitious and motivated and had a kind of discipline and seriousness about their studies that sometimes characterizes um, immigrants. And uh, I, I worked hard at school um, and ended up, after four years of high school and two years of, of, of middle school, uh, getting into Columbia College um, as a freshman. And that was a absolutely pivotal, life-changing opportunity. I did not know what I was getting into. I, my English was barely good enough to pass the, the entrance exams and, and function at Columbia at a, at a viable academic level. Um, I didn't know what the Ivy League was. I certainly didn't know what the core curriculum was. But I landed at Columbia and was introduced to its core curriculum. Right, a, a required set of courses organized around the study of great works in the Western tradition, taken in common by every every student at Columbia. So I suddenly found myself in a group of peers who were reading and talking about the fundamental issues of society, of human existence. And that experience was the opening for me, not only to begin to make sense of my life in the United States, but to begin to make sense of my life as a human being, of who I was, of what my uh, possibilities were, of what this world I had landed in was, and to start to put together a sense of myself. And um, for uh, after college, I stayed at Columbia for graduate school. Um, I, I was so turned on by this new, new world of thinking and writing and reading. I, I just wanted to keep doing it. Um, so I stayed at Columbia for a, for a PhD and, and went right into the faculty at Columbia, but always oriented towards undergraduate education of the type that had been so transformative to me. So when uh, the opportunity to, to take an appointment focused on the core curriculum came up, I immediately grabbed it and began to get involved in uh, policy issues, organizational issues, issues of how to make this experience accessible to as many people as possible and as powerful as, uh, to, to as many people as possible as it had, as it had been for me. Um, and uh, that whole kind of personal aspect gets captured in the book, along with real close readings of the text, real arguments and critique of higher education and the place of liberal education in it, and the, 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 the ability, the general ability of real rigorous liberal education, even in a system that is so ostensibly marked by its liberal tradition as the American system. Sorry for the long-winded answer. No, 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 it's fascinating. No, thank you. And, and it seems to me that y you're saying something really important here about questions of diversity, privilege. I mean, being a low-income immigrant at an elite metropolitan school, it's something like that books can set you free. There's a leveling up effect here, like a, a, it's an entry into a world, not a barrier to entry. That liberal education has democratizing power, right? This is, this yes. is what you're saying. And that's right. And that is very much in the DNA of the Columbia program. The Columbia program, which starts now a little over, over 100 years ago, comes at a point in the institution when Columbia had uh, moved away from its orientation like the other Ivy League schools towards prep school, elite, cultural, kind of old uh, elite, old American elites. Uh, Columbia being in New York City, uh, always had a more immigrant flavor. And in 1897, it dropped its Greek entrance requirement 
Then early in the century, it dropped, it, it dropped its Latin entrance requirements. And that moment when Colombia stops requiring the classical languages as, as, as entrance prerequisites is a moment when Colombia reorients itself towards the life of the city and towards the immigrant populations that come through the city. Mm-hmm. Now, it's a, it's a complex history. Colombia, like other Ivy Leagues, did, so, did some very, um, from our vantage point, uh, morally reprehensible forms of exclusion, particularly of, of, of Jews. Um, nonetheless, uh, Colombia organized itself with a view towards bringing in a sort of student that would never think of and would never be allowed in to the high kind of culture, the halls of, of, of elite education in the United States. And what it did curricular, curricularly to make that shift in its identity possible was establish the core curriculum. The idea being that students were going to be placed, placed before them would be the kind of cultural wealth, the kind of cultural capital, the kind of philosophical, but also civic and discursive tools with which they can, they can become fully functioning, fully empowered, full agents in the American democratic project. Um, so the core curriculum from its beginning is aimed precisely at leveling the playing field. It's aimed not at cuddling or, or, or selecting or privileging the elite. It is created precisely to level the playing field between those elites who might have had access to this tradition within their, their family and cultural context to level the playing field between them and people who, like me, although the student who was like me at, in the, at, at the end of the 18th, the beginning of the 19th century, was probably Eastern European rather than a, than a Latino immigrant. But students like me who were low income and had, did not have access to the traditional resources that the uh, intelligentsia and the people who, 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 who got the most out of the higher education system typically did. So this democratizing impulse is very much at the core of what the liberal education around the study of great books is about. And today, it continues to have that role for students like me and for students who every year come to Colombia and go to other places where they do things like this and find in this program the kind of general education that opens the door for their full development in this society. That's fascinating, Roosevelt. Thank you so much. And we'll come back maybe a little bit later to to the curriculum itself um, uh, along the lines that you've been speaking about. But before we do that, and rather unfairly, can we take a quick glance at the four key figures that you've chosen to focus on in your book? which, as I mentioned, are Augustine, Socrates, um, Freud, and Gandhi in, in, in that order, kind of in chronological order, except you do Augustine before Socrates. Tell us a bit about the key takeaways for you from these four great writers. I mean, in the case of Augustine, you talk about your discovery through him that the greatest goods are not material, um, and that the will to acquire and the will to power is something like the equivalent of what he says is original sin, whereas a liberal education is searching for a highest, for the highest virtue. So that's him. And tell us a bit about Socrates as well, the wonderful picture that you paint of him rising like a genie out of a bottle when you found a copy of, um, uh, of those key Socratic dialogues, Apology, Crito and Fido, in a, in a pile of trash in the street near where you live. Um, what the key theme seems to be there is, again, material wealth versus excellence in life, life as an end in itself. You talk about Freud in a slightly different way because it's wound up with your own experience of psychoanalysis in the, in the Freudian tradition, which is kind of almost a New York trope as far as, uh, as far as we're concerned. I mean, this is what New Yorkers do, right? They get analyzed. But as with Augustine and Socrates, this is part of a search for an underlying truth, a, a real virtuous self, right? And then Gandhi, 
what he had against Western civilization, which I think he called a contradiction in terms once, um, what he had against it was its materialism ab above all, where he has a lot in common with Western thinkers and writers such as Tolstoy and Thoreau and even Rousseau. So I, I've jumbled all of that together, Roosevelt, not very fairly, yeah. but speak as you, as, you, as you wish about what was the message that these four books or the messages that these four books delivered to you in your, in your life's journey? Yeah. So those four thinkers, one thing that binds them together is their interest and commitment to self-knowledge. Um, the oldest of them, of course, is, is Socrates, and, and Socrates would often quote the, the kind of inscription, the inscription in the temple of Apollo, know thyself. It was a kind of guiding, uh, guiding star to Socrates' philosophical activity, leading to probably the most famous line in, 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 in Socratic, the Socratic canon, the unexamined life is not worth living, uh, which Socrates says to the Athenian jury when he is defending his, his, his philosophic activity, um, his life is at stake. And he says, I, I, I cannot live a life that is not oriented towards the search of truth and self-knowledge in this way. And I am prepared to accept the ultimate punishment rather than give up that, that kind of life, and, and he does. Um, each of these authors in some way embodies that commitment to self-examination, this commitment to understanding one's own experience, to, to, to introspection. Um, they also, part of the, why they end up in the book is because of the impact they had on, on me. So there is, a, there is a part of the selection of these authors that is simply idiosyncratic that these are, are, are writers whom, when I read, um, had a, a profound and transformative impact on me. And, and there were some other writers that I read that, that didn't, and who subsequent to my initial reading, uh, then they kind of detonate on a, on a, on a delayed, uh, de kind of a, a delayed detonation. Um, but these, these, these authors had an immediate, immediate impact on me that in some way reoriented me. Um, I, I talk about St. Augustine first because it's, it, it was the, the book when I was a first year student at Columbia, that crucial year when so much was coming into view, so much was so, such a profound uh, metamorphosis had begun, living away from home, living um, on campus, interacting with professors, with staff, with students who were unlike anyone that I had ever met. I, 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 don't, I just had not met, encountered, talked to, let alone live among people like that. So it was such a, a profound, profound um, moment of transition for me, comparable to the transition of coming from the Dominican Republic to the United States. It was, it was that radical, uh, you used the word discontinuity in your earlier question. There was such a profound discontinuity between the world and life I knew and this world at Columbia. And St. Augustine was the decisive textual home, the decisive uh, a book in orienting, grounding, anchoring myself in that year. And part of it is because I, I um, had come to Columbia having had a very profound religious experience in high school um, through a series of kind of events in my life that I detailed to some extent in the book, I ended up not living with my mother because we couldn't pay rent, we couldn't, we couldn't survive, we didn't have an income. I ended up living in a, in a distant relative's house and they were in the middle of kind of a religious revival, that household. And I got swept along and, 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 and had a conversion experience into a, very kind of fundamentalist Pentecostal uh, sect of Christianity, very, very hardcore, but very meaningful to me. And when I came to Colombia, I was trying to figure out what that meant. What was my relationship to religion, to God, to that particular branch of Christianity, to my kind of budding intellectual life, to this um, philosophical ideas that I had already begun to to encounter in high school. 
And St. Augustine presented me with a thinker whose commitment to truth and whose devotion to faith were, I think, in the final analysis, one and the same. It was the first time that I understood the possibility of reconciling fears, intellectual integrity with the possibility of faith. Um, Again, as I detail in the book, Augustine did not restore or revive my faith in Christianity. It's almost like Augustine gave me permission, gave me the validation to pursue rational inquiry and investigation into the world around me without um, shackling it to some pre-established faith commitment. Um, If God in any shape or form was going to reveal himself or itself to me, it was going to be, it was going to have to be compatible with my understanding. It was going to have to, in some way, be illuminated by the light of reason. Um, So Augustine gave me this um, this kind of uh, model for fierce inquiry into the truth. And another important thing Augustine gave me was a language with which to look into myself for, uh, as, as kind of the primary arena for that investigation, uh, language of interiority. Uh, Augustine is tremendously introspective. Um, tremendous, he, he, we know the heart and mind of St. Augustine better than we know any ancient, any ancient figure. Part of, and part of what's remarkable about him is how contemporary he sounds, how mm-hmm. he is dealing with questions and encounters dilemmas and uh, puzzles in himself that I encounter in myself and probably that any uh, self-reflective person encounters in himself. Um, so that's part of what I do with, with Augustine. There's, it, it's, a, it's a way to reflect both on what liberal arts education provides as a way of orienting a life, but also reflecting how that landed on me at that particular point. Um, Plato, I had encountered in high school. As you said, I, I, it's, it's an extraordinarily fortunate Incident that that people out next door to me in Queens when I was a sophomore in high school threw away a large number of books and I, I saw those books there. Some of the books were beautiful, bound in 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 a, just as objects where where they looked like precious, valuable things. And I I, I grabbed two volumes. Couldn't read English very well, so it was a kind of aspiration. But I I picked up two volumes whose names I recognized. One was a volume that included Plato, and one is a volume that included Shakespeare. Those names are recognized even though I didn't know much besides recognizing those names as as literary uh, figures of some sort. And I started reading Plato on my own, the the Apology of Socrates, the the, the defense um, before the Athenian jury, his interactions with a friend who's trying to get him out of jail, the credo when, when after he has been condemned, his final... Uh, dialogue uh, before he drinks the hemlock and dies. And, and these are extraordinarily compelling uh, narratives and dialogues um, that I started reading on my own and which a teacher in my high school saw me reading, approached me, and uh, in kind of tremendous excitement, we developed a very strong intimate relationship as a mentor. He became my most important mentor. And and, and in some ways, the instrument um, by which my path was kind of guided towards Colombia. He was the person who encouraged me to apply to Colombia um, and who, without me knowing what he was doing, but he knowing very well what he was doing, began to orient my my thinking, my intellect in this uh, direction. I think he saw the potential in me to to be a thinker, to be an an intellectual. Um, Freud is a thinker that I also encountered um, that first year at Columbia and who over the years um, became more and more important to me as I underwent my own psychoanalysis, as I began to, to grapple with the ways in which Freud is right. Freud is wrong in so many ways, and, and his most famous 
in kind of general intellectual culture for the ways in which he is he is wrong, in part because the ways in which he is right have been so deeply absorbed into the culture that we no longer give him credit for it. Um, but Freud is a very, very radical thinker. Perhaps his most important insight has to do with the dominance of unconscious mental processes in our in our sense of self, in our decision making, in our personality. And um, Freud gave me, it kind of opened up my mind as this world of mystery to explore, um, to learn about. So Freud gave me his roadmap and this and this, this these these tools with which to explore my mind with a level of sophistication and a level of kind of self awareness that is it's quite it was quite new and quite quite extraordinary. So things like dreams, things like humor, things like slips of the tongue, um, associations, all of these things began to open up doors into my self understanding and and into trying to construct for myself an identity that could absorb these discontinuities that had accumulated in my life. Um, so, so Freud was very, very key for me in trying to attain a sense of integration of my experiences. And Freud uh, alert, alerted me and kind of alert so many students. That's why I think he's a, he's, a, he's a very good text for liberal education, kind of alert students to this dimension of their own, their own experience. And then Gandhi, who I encountered, is, is, is the thinker, the most recent, most contemporary of the writers, also the one that I encountered last. I encountered Gandhi not in a classroom, but on my own, um, in part because my education, by the time I was, I was done with grad, grad school, had been so rooted in, this, in the Western tradition, and I knew there were other things out there. And Gandhi seemed like a figure that bridged the Western tradition with something else. So I started reading Gandhi just as a way to kind of uh, expand the kind of thinking, the kind of exploration that had guided my education so far. And Gandhi proved to, to, to open up, not only open up a whole new world, but to cast uh, a very important light in the tradition that I knew well already. And, 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 and Gandhi, um, you know, in my book, I talk about the way that Gandhi helped me come to terms with and kind of digest what had been a deeply postmodern theoretical education, education in, in theory for me. Um, and, you know, postmodernism poses a challenge to the academy and to intellectual life that is absolutely deadly to the, lib to the project of liberal education. We can get into that. And Gandhi was one of the ways that, 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 that I came to sort of tame and confront and again integrate the insights of postmodern literary theory and postmodern philosophical insights integrate those into a kind of more holistic and whole uh, and and um, unitary cohesive whole um in in kind of my intellectual life again sorry to go on and on. Um, no, 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 this is, this is, these, yeah. it's, it's, this is, this is fascinating, Roosevelt. And before we move into that, that last part of what we're going to talk about, which is the problems raised by core curriculums in general, in a way, yeah. and the, the, the things that they bring, um, of course, many would instantly comment that the group of writers or um, um, figures from the past that you've um, chosen are diverse enough in terms of ethnicity, you've got an Indian, you've got a North African, um, but of course they're all men. Uh, and here's two, two more men talking about them. And I know this in no way reflects the kind of gender balance in the, in the core curriculum, but it is a striking thing. And I'm, so what do you, what do you say uh, to, to students, to, to commentators who, who just say, look, you know, there are so few female figures available for study before the 19th century, it, this is a problem uh, in, a, in a curriculum that's weighted towards the past. That means it's always going to be weighted towards, towards men. What's your, what's your quick, just a quick take on, on that problem? Yeah. Well, it is a problem. And I think that's the first thing we have to acknowledge. And the problem reflects a problematic history. That is, we as a society, we as a species, 
have exerted the, a gender dominance and exploitation and oppression, one gender to the other, that goes back deep into our past and which has shaped the evolution of society. And when we see the absence of women writers and women philosophers and women artists and women leaders in our history, we are seeing a direct and clear manifestation of that, um, of that history. So problematic and violent and brutal. So uh, the first thing we need to do is to acknowledge that. Um, the next thing we need to do is to understand how it is that we have made such strides in overcoming that kind of hierarchical, oppressive, exploitative arrangement. We're not all the way there yet. Um, though that, that legacy and those dynamics still are palpable and in some corners of our life dominant, yet in no way are they acceptable, in no way are they, um, do they express the values that we have come as a society, as a culture to agree on. Um, so understanding that trajectory is the second thing, because in the absence of women writers, for example, um, you can begin to read the dynamics that will produce the discourse of equality, the notion that, 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 that there was something wrong with that. That critique of the arrangement comes from within that tradition. So, you know, take, you know, the Iliad, take, for example, or the Odyssey, books that are so male dominated. I mean, the Iliad is so full of testosterone, of violence and blood and gore and the, and the trading of women and selling of women and raping of women. Um, Yet, even in that book, you see a kind of resistance. You see a kind of female assertiveness, sometimes a female threat that is a constant in the culture. So you can see in the tradition, as it exists, exists the seeds and the precursors, the antecedents to the moral evolution that we will undertake. Um, so yeah. it is problematic for sure. What we cannot do, and for which there is no rational justification is to abandon the study or our attention to that tradition simply because it is problematic in that way. It is, it is the most kind of anti-intellectual reactionary thing that we can do. Yeah. Yes, that's, that's fascinating. And you were talking about um, seeds. Uh, an obvious example would be Antigone, um, a, yeah. a, very, a very early example, a play written, of course, by a man, um, but right, the figure, right. that the, the role that the woman plays is transformative in, uh, in, in that place. Right. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's one right. thing that one can say. But look, right. thank, you for, thank you for your answer. And it takes us into the question of the content of the Columbia core curriculum, what's in it. Um, you make a very interesting point in your, in your book um, that, these, that these vital transformative texts four of which you, well, texts and writers, four of which you speak about in your book, many or most of them in translation, and you've mentioned the dropping of the Greek requirements, so it's fine, you know, these can be read in translation. You make the point that they should always be read as though recent, as if they were, as if they'd just been written. So, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I think this is, a, this is a, a, an essential way to approach these texts for students. But what arguments do you use to push back against scholars who say, you know, it's a fair scholarly point of view, who say you should not read unhistorically. You should have masses of historical context as far as you can on the one hand, mm -hmm. and you should have an equally important kind of thematic context on the other hand but you're saying yeah. that the non-disciplinary non framework is so important and I agree but can you yeah. speak to that yeah little? yeah I think here one needs to make a distinction between general education which in the American tradition of higher education has meant liberal education that is a portion of the educational curriculum that is general in the sense that it's applicable, relevant to all of the students, regardless of their professional specialization eventually. It is, general education is liberal in that it is 
detached or liberated from any particular professional goal. Um, so we have to make a distinction between liberal or general education, that education that's appropriate for any individual, and specialized professional education. If you are going to be a classicist, if you are going to be a scholar, even if you think if you're, if you're going to be a literature major or a history major, there's a whole scholarly apparatus and conversation that, that, that becomes part of your education that really is irrelevant or only minimally relevant in the general education classroom. It might be relevant, or I think it is in fact relevant to the instructor of the liberal arts classroom. Mm -hmm. But is but is 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 extraneous, ex exogenous, extraneous, external mm -hmm. to the central mission of liberal education, which has to do with the student coming into conversation with great minds, great questions, great debates, as articulated in the text. When we're talking about textual courses, you can do art history or do art courses or music courses. There are other, other, other encounters, other intellectual forms of, of expression, uh, artistic, et cetera, philosophical exploration. But if we're talking about text-based courses, which are the most common and rightfully central to, to the education, um, then those texts are going to raise questions and issues that matter to the students by virtue of their shared humanity with the writer. Um, this is what makes them appropriate for the task of general education. It is the ways in which they speak to and illuminate the common human experience of this uh, and the experience of the student as he or she lives it. That is, those texts are going to illuminate your own life. They're going to illuminate the world in which you live today. This is what I mean by reading them as if they were written recently, as, they, as, as if they were contemporary. That is, these books speak to me today. Socrates... Apology is not about some old man 2,500 years ago who got in trouble with Athenian authorities. So the apology of Socrates in a general education context is relevant because of what, what it says to us and to the students today. Because of the light it sheds on the students' own experience, on the task of education that we're engaged in, on the examined life, on the nature of politics, on the nature of group dynamics, on the nature of the search for truth, of the Socratic dialogue, et cetera. All of these are questions that are and must be alive for the student today as, uh, uh, as living, vibrant, electric questions for the students today that matter today, not because they're old, but because despite being old, they continue to be relevant. So this is the task of general education, is to put before the students these kinds of intellectual, philosophical, ethical, moral, um, artistic, aesthetic experiences that speak to the student in their condition of human, uh, as human beings. That's why it's general, because they matter to every student. Um, again, we, we do distinguish that if to, with the advanced scholarly academic as opposed to general specialized or professionalized. One of the mistakes that even undergraduate majors and undergraduate education makes is to let the academic specialization choke and in, in effect push out general education. So much of general education today in the United States is in fact watered down specialized education. Um, it is taught by specialists and it is taught by specialists with a view to their special to the specialist training and with a view of preparing students to replicate their professional specialization. So the general education today in the United States which is a system I know very well though the point applies even more broadly. General education today is um, for the most part, deeply, deeply compromised in, in colleges and universities. Uh, if you wanted to be really technical about it, you might say that liberal education is actually missing from most undergraduate curricula. 
<clears throat> Thank you. That's that's interesting, uh, fascinating, in fact. And and what you s seems to me you were skirting around so, saying, and would you agree that what you might call the knowledge model in the university, which is basically science oriented, but it's also, as you've said, reflected in the discipline based um, humanities grad schools now as well, the professionalization, if you like, of, 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 of scholarship. Um, and this is all derived from the, the Humboldt research university model yeah. created in the early 19th century. So there's all of that kind of model of knowledge on the one hand, and at the same time, the function of the universities now is seen as overwhelmingly a professional and technical training one. So you've got the knowledge model, you've got the professional and technical training function. Both of these, these two things together, both of them of great importance. I mean, nobody's, nobody's saying they shouldn't exist or anything, but between them, they have squeezed the life out of what you might call the wisdom model of the, the, true, the true liberal arts education. Would you agree? Yeah. Yes. Um, the way you put it, the kind of the knowledge production task of the university, which has become so dominant and which does come out of the Humboldtian research ideal, very powerful ideal, uncontestably beneficial to our society and worthy to be supported and extended, but not if it comes at the expense of another way of knowing, another way of cultivating aspects of our humanity that are not utilitarian, that are not material, that are not valuable for the sake of what they can do, but are valuable for the sake of who they allow you to become. Um, one of the reviewers of my book um, said, look, oh, this stuff about the humanities and and the the, the cultivation of the individual and self knowledge this is all hogwash. The university is in the business of not is in the knowledge business is the phrase that he uses. And the way to 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 think about the humanities is as in the university is as contributing to this knowledge business of the university. Um, and uh, that that reviewer, although he's wrong in his review of my uh, and his understanding of, of of what i'm arguing does put him put his finger on something very fundamental um which is that liberal education is not primarily in the business of knowledge production it is in the business mm -hmm. of cultivating individual individuals what justifies the practice of liberal education is not the ways in which it adds to the knowledge enterprise of the university but the ways in, in, in which it shapes and cultivates the individuals that will then undertake the knowledge enterprise of the university. It is a much deeper um, cultivation of human capacities that are not utilitarian, that are not deployed or cultivated in the service of some predetermined end. Now, knowledge is very much at play. I mean, we don't teach in ignorance and we don't ignore facts and you know, sometimes I, I use the example, imagine that a liberal arts, the task of a liberal arts lesson is going to be to ponder the rhythms in Shakespeare's sonnets, a given sonnet. Now, to do that, to ponder the rhythms, you're going to understand, you need to understand something about meter, you're going to understand something about the conventions of the sonnet, you're going to need to understand something perhaps about pronunciation of Elizabethan English, you're going to have to understand all kinds of technical matters, but the point is not for you to learn those things. The point is for you to acquire those things in the service of a deeper appreciation, deeper mm. engagement, deeper pondering, grappling with this mm. other thing that happens in your brain and in your life and in your mm. sense of yourself by understanding those things. So the knowledge is instrumental in that sense. It is not the goal, but it is a tool that's used to develop, to cultivate, to address this other thing that is valuable in itself, that is, has intrinsic value. And that idea of intrinsic value is one of the things that is preserved in the university in its liberal mission. And in our society, increasingly, it's difficult to even convey to people that there is such a thing as intrinsic value. Sometimes you tell people, no, this is 
valuable in itself. And they'll say, okay, but but what is that good for? I say, no, no, it's not good for anything. It's just good in itself. Okay, well, what can you do with it? Why do you do it? Um, it? It is just an idea that is increasingly counterintuitive in a culture where value is always quantified, monetized, commodified. This idea that there is such a thing as intrinsic value, such a thing as something that is worth pursuing in itself, not as a means to attain something else. These are these are very wise words, um, Roosevelt. Thank you. Uh, and, and there's another sort of point of risk in what in to, to this to this liberal arts function, this wisdom function that you're talking about. I think isn't there that's arisen relatively recently, which is a kind of you might call it an activist, uh, almost an ideological approach, which tends to focus so so kind of exclusively, um, uh, almost neurotically, on what it sees as power functions. Uh, mm -hmm. And that focus mm -hmm. is so strong that it's also had something to do, I mean, in the humanities, obviously, it's had something to do with that right. choking off of the kind of process of right. intrinsic value that you're yeah. talking about. And, yeah. and this is contrib contributed to maybe a little bit by, you know, administrators, busy scholars, They've got their lives to get on with. They don't want to push back against this kind of puritanical, identitarian sort of moralism that seems so endemic in academia today, certainly in the United States. You know, in that climate, the last thing anyone is interested in is virtue or the well-lived life. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It is another form of, of instrumentalism um, mm. that is subordinating the goals of education subordinating the goal the, the goals of the pursuit of truth to some other goal. I mean, I think it's easy for us to see how subordinating the pursuit of truth to the pursuit of, tro of profit is problematic. If all we think about education is a way for you to make money and acquire power, that's going to be problematic. And I think most people will agree with that. It is less easy to see how, it is, how it's problematic to subsume the pursuit of truth into the activism for social justice. Um, that's less easy to see because social justice is something that we're also committed to. It's something that we're also, almost by definition, uh, mm -hmm. going to value. And to then see that it is actually a corruption of education when it is subordinated to an ideological pursuit of social justice, when it is seen as instrumental to achieving a, a, a political end. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a tricky thing and it's a hard thing to argue, particularly with the fervor, the passion, the kind of idealism and, and commitment of so many of our young people. Um, but that is part of the education. Um, that is being able to complicate, being able to introduce nuance and um, uncertainty, skepticism um, to the moral simplicity and uh, abs moral absolutism that is often a characteristic manifestation of youth. Um, we probably have all been there. Um, and part of what we do as educators is to take that passion that, you know, one thing that young people can't stand is hypocrisy, um, compromise, selling out. Um, and that keeps Thank God, because that is ultimately the engine that keeps our society progressing morally. But part of what we have to do as educators is take that raw energy commitment on compromising visionary idealism. Is take that and harness it. Um, to use an old world, civilize it. Um, that is, give it also a sense of... Uh, reality 
give it a sense of um, real encounter with the complexities of the world. Um, and that is a, a, that's a conversation. That is a debate. I live with what you mentioned, which is the fact that so many uh, college administrations have take their job to be a kind of risk management is to not uh, anger the students, to not end up um, with protests, to not end up in the news headlines. It is a kind of, instead of education, it is risk management that some so, so many campuses leaderships are most, most uh, concerned with. Um, and those are, there is a way in which those are incompatible. There is a way in which if your priority is going to be risk management of your reputation, of your um, uh, uh, popularity, um, that that is going to be in some instances incompatible with, with what is the real soul of the university, which has to do with the pursuit of truth has to do with the uh, uh, right with fronting reality um, and the world with absolute intellectual honesty, regardless of whether what that reveals is ugly or pretty. Absolutely, and and we don't really have time to to go into this at any depth. But surely, equally, the central function of the university is the teaching. And what is actually happening in that classroom? The, the teacher is so important. The students are the most important thing. The texts are reading the students as much as the students are reading the texts. And, and yet, teaching seems to be taking more and more and more of a back seat in the in the uh, in the career development of academics. It's not incentivized. Uh, it's the research and the productivity of your research that makes people world famous uh, academics. Not how brilliant a, a teacher they were. So this is, wouldn't you say, this is, a, this is something that we have to think seriously about as well, and that you do think about yes. in the Columbia model. Yes, and that Absolutely. set of incentives and reinforcements in the academic profession ultimately produces a neglect of undergraduate education. Mm, um, and part, yeah, part of the alienation that so many undergraduates feel vis-a-vis -vis the institution is precisely fueled by this, is precisely fueled by the absence, the lack of any real recognition and engagement with their humanity. The fact that they are seen as, as, as kind of uh, customers and that the point is to manipulate and shepherd them through four years of tuition payment without really engaging in this fundamental task of education, of drawing out and, and cultivating their dignity, their human dignity, engaging that in a serious way. That can only be done within this framework of liberal education, recognizing the kind of irreducible worth and liberty of the individual as an individual. All of these um, uh, kind of what I have called the risk management strategies are in fact ways of flattening and ignoring, papering over the individuality and the true dignity of our students. students. Absolutely right, absolutely. Well, we're, we're unfortunately, we're almost at the end of our time, um, Roosevelt, but so maybe just a final question. Um, it's, it, it, it's wonderfully encouraging to hear you speak. So, so can I just ask you, <clears throat> are you optimistic yourself about the future of the liberal education, what you might call the transformative texts or the virtue and wisdom course. Because for all the reasons that we've been discussing, there is a risk the humanities sector will shrink in resources and in prestige. Uh, this kind of liberal education will in increasingly seem like a kind of luxury good for those who can afford the time and the money. And that's the last thing we want, given inspirational life stories like yours. Obviously, this is the kind of story we want. So, you know, are you optimistic? How do we persuade more and more universities to adopt this kind of model for more and more students to, to access? What is your view about the future of the model? It's a mixed answer because I see two simultaneous trends 
going on. Um, one is a, is a trend towards thinking about education exclusively in transactional terms as instrumental. Um, and universities and colleges shrinking liberal education, shrinking the humanities and becoming more and more technical, vocational, more and more online. At the same time, I see a resurgence of interest and value and um, enthusiasm and commitment to this kind of uh, liberal education. Well, the Ramsey Center is an example of this. Outfits, some of which are adjacent to the university, some of which are independent of universities, some of which are very much inside universities. Mm -hmm. This kind of recovery of a meaning of education that has been uh, in, in ideological and institutional decline. Um, so I am, I'm involved and I know of many uh, curricular initiatives within universities. Sometimes it's honors, honors college, colleges um, within universities. Sometimes it's particular majors. Sometimes it's new or, or developing curricular general education programs. So there is a lot of activity in the, in the general education space, as it were, that that gives me hope and we are you know there's been in the last 10 15 years there's been some very very palpable progress and movement um as kind of the 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 the, the crisis in the humanities so called has in fact created these very powerful opportunities so it's a mixed answer and i think that mm -hmm. it, it's it's unclear which way it's going to go although what is clear is that the way that it's going to go is going to depend on what people like me and people like you do. Um, so the, the crisis that I see, I also see as an opportunity and I see it as a motivation to, um, to do the kind of work that I'm doing. And I'm always encouraged and heartened because every time I enter into a classroom and have these kinds of conversations with the students, mm -hmm. I see what it does to them. Um, I just Absolutely. finished last week teaching mm -hmm. high school students who are low income, first generation college bound, a curriculum of political thought beginning with Plato and Aristotle and Thucydides and Hobbes and Locke and Rousseau and mm -hmm. Jefferson and Lincoln. Mm -hmm. And those students were, as they have been in previous years, just utterly uh, excited and, and, and awakened and alive and, 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 and transformed by this experience. And as long as the the students are hungry for what we're giving i do not lose heart or or become pessimistic that's that's wonderful to hear and very uh, encouraging and inspirational and i think what you said just at the end there about what happens when you actually go back into the classroom and the reactions from the yeah. students is exactly yeah. the same as the experience that the, the teachers and the students are having in our three partner universities at Wollongong and yeah. uh, Queensland and the Australian Catholic University. So there's still a lot of good stuff happening and we can just together uh, hope, that it, hope that it expands and continues. But unfortunately, we're out of time. So, Professor Roosevelt Montas, I just want to thank you uh, on behalf of all of our listeners uh, for a wonderful conversation. It's just terrific to hear what, you, what you've done and what you are doing. Uh, I strongly recommend the book, the Socrates, Rescuing Socrates book, to all of our listeners, published last year by, by Princeton. Uh, and very, very warm thanks to you, Roosevelt, for speaking with us today. Very much appreciated. Thank you, Simon. It's a real, real pleasure. And, uh, and that's all from us uh, on this occasion. And uh, stay tuned. There'll be more talks both live and online coming up in the next few months. So for now, this is Simon Haynes saying goodbye.